This is a house. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you a secret about this house. Spider-Man lives here. And I know you think Spider-Man's secret identity is Peter Parker, but his real name is Owen. One day, I was in the kitchen cleaning dishes, and I could hear Spider-Man fighting crime in the living room. He was flying through the air, swaying from building to building, catching bank robbers and thieves. And then, I heard a loud noise. The floor shook, silence, followed by a cry. The Spider-Man found that day that superheroes get hurt. But after a few stitches and a cookie, he was ready to fight crime again. <laughs> well, what if Spider-Man's great-grandmother was the one that fell? Unfortunately, statistics don't show to just a few stitches for her. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention reports that one of every five folds in older, in older adults result in a serious injury, such as a broken bone. And these injuries make it difficult for them to do independent daily activities and live independently. Over 65% of older adults that suffer a fold do not return to their previous living status. And folds are not just a problem for the older adults or their families. They're also a problem for the healthcare system. In 2015, the total medical cost for folds was over $50 billion. And this is just increasing as our population ages. Now, I know what you're thinking. Here comes the commercial about the button that you wear around your neck. Right? <laughs> well, there is no question. Wearable devices are definitely an excellent alternative to ask for help. I mean, think about the Apple Watch, the one that was released only a few weeks ago. It has a new feature that can automatically detect if a person has fallen. That is amazing technology. That is, if you're wearing it. Because, I mean, let's be honest about this. Will you wear a device to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night? And it's at this time, when it's dark, that we're more likely to trip on something that we don't see. How about your parents and grandparents? Would they wear something at all times? And what if, as we age, we develop cognitive impairments such as those produced by dementia and Alzheimer's disease? We're just going to forget to charge our devices. We're going to forget that we actually wear them in the first place. So what if your house could feel? And I do mean feeling and not seeing, because even though cameras are a very good alternative to detecting faults, Cameras are regularly not welcome in some parts of a home. Well, it turns out that this is actually possible based on research that we're developing here at the University of South Carolina that studies how your house moves. Believe it or not, we can detect very small levels of vibration with sensors that are just not that expensive and are easy to install in existing structures. These are not motion sensors, rather, these are the type of sensors that scientists use to study earthquakes. But in your house, they can detect motions and vibrations due to air conditioning units, people walking, uh, elevators, and yes, people falling. These vibrations have different characteristics depending on the type of impact, the location of the impact, and also how hard the impact is. So let's say that I have a sensor in the kitchen. If I jump in my bedroom, the sensor will, will get vibrations with different characteristics than if I jump in my living room. So Benjamin Davis, a former student of mine and myself, come up with an algorithm that uses these floor vibrations to identify and locate those impacts in the floors of a house or an apartment. But more importantly, we can actually identify the force of those impacts. Well, why are those forces important? Because this is what's going to let us know whether or not those vibrations were produced by a person falling or an object striking the floor. Now, after we tested our algorithm, we were very happy. Benjamin and I, we were working on this for many, many years, and we were finally doing some good progress. 
And we talked to one of our uh, research um, collaborators. He's a gerontologist. His name is Victor Hurt. He was also very happy at the re about the result, but then, then he paused. And he said, you know, this is good, but wouldn't it be better if we can prevent the fall? I mean, I have to admit, I rolled my eyes. I hope he didn't notice. So we went back to the drawing board, and we started thinking about all sorts of crazy ideas. What if we have floors with embedded airbags that will deploy automatically? <laughs> well, no, hopefully nobody will be ejected out of their houses by accident. What if we have a robot with a cane that will walk with you, ready to steady you if you, if you stumble? Certainly not the best ideas. But Victor, our research collaborator, he came out with, a, with the best idea of all. What if we measure gait? Well, it turns out you can tell a lot about a person, not only by their shoes, but also by the way they walk. Stacy Fritz, she is an exercise scientist here at the University of South Carolina, has done a lot of research about this topic. And she has found that there is a strong correlation between the walking speed of an individual and also all sorts of, of other things, like, for example, the risk of hospitalization and also the risk of falling. In a nutshell, if your walking speed is about one meter per second or higher, you are very likely to be able to do daily activities on, the, on your own. If your walking speed slows down to less than 0.7 meters per second, you are at risk of falling. So right now, we are at the stage where we're starting to uh, gather some of these gate parameters based on the same levels of vibrations that we were collecting before not to prevent the fall, but to identify people that is at risk of falling. And our research findings is telling us that we can do even more. We can tell people behavior, as how much, that, how much activity they do in their houses. When, when Spider-Man's uh, old twin brothers were about two years old, I instrumented the first floor of my house. And when I compare the schedule of my family with what, what the sensors found, I was really surprised. So let's just start first with the schedule of my kids. Uh, my wife found these clocks that change color at 7 a.m. as a way to teach the kids if it's time to get up in the morning or if it's time to go back to sleep. And, uh, so, and because there is something embedded in every two-year-old that I just don't understand, they just don't believe in sleeping in. Right? So 7 a.m. is almost exactly the time in which they come downstairs for breakfast. After that, and every two-year-old working schedule, you have play, 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 <laughs> nap, play, 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 more naps, play, and then going to bed. Don't worry, we do feed our kids, but for the purpose of this presentation, I, I included um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks as part of playtime, because those happen generally around the, the location where the sensors were installed. Now, let's superimpose the level of activity that was recorded by the sensors. Lighter colors and reds show the levels of high activity, and those match perfectly with the times where the kids were playing or having lunch. Darker colors are the levels of low intensity, and that matches perfectly with nap time before they came out of bed in the morning and after they went to bed in the evening. So it's amazing that you can tell so much with only two sensors that were placed on the floor under a sofa. It's a little creepy if you ask me. <laughs> now, it's at this time that we, I think we need to start having a conversation about the technology we're bringing in our homes. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with technology knowing at the time that I get up in the morning, what time I go for work, right? And I think the jury for that is still out, but we need to have that conversation as we invite uh, Alexa and Siri and Google to our homes. And we all have smartphones in our, in our pockets that can pot potentially track our location at any time. So my challenge for you today is for think about your house or our apartment differently when you get home. Think beyond what, what it is, beyond what you think about refuse from rain, or be, beyond the place that keeps you warm in cold, in cold winter days and, and, and cool in hot summer, summer days. I mean, think about the possibilities. Even beyond what 
Joan Gaines can think. Buildings can let us know the number of people that were in, in each room before an earthquake or a fire. Houses can have superpowers to let us know who is inside the house for security system applications. And apartments can let us know or can help us with our parents and grandparents. So what is your dream for your house today? Thank you.